Mr. McCoy here with part three of The Castle in the Attic. As you recall, William was sneaking food to Sir Simon. Sir Simon, William called softly. I've brought your breakfast. There was no answer. He waited for a minute, half expecting to hear the clank of the small man's metal shoes on the stone staircase. I'll leave it for you in the kitchen. See you later. William crumbled up the bacon and half the toast and piled it on the kitchen table. Maybe I did dream the whole thing, he muttered to himself as he wheeled his bike out of the garage. Jason was waiting for him in the front hall. He and Jason had been best friends ever since first grade. William was the shortest kid in the class and Jason wore thick glasses so they were usually the brunt of everybody's jokes. Hanging out together had helped them to develop tough skins and deaf ears. They walked up to the classroom. As usual, they had it to themselves for a few minutes. Nobody else in their class ever got to school early. You're late today. My parents were asking me the usual questions. How's school? How's science? How's history? How's life? You're lucky, Jason said. My parents never ask me anything. That's because your mother is home when you get there in the afternoon. She doesn't think she has to concentrate on you the way my mother does. Yes, she does. She just concentrates on the wrong things, like have I practiced the piano and did I put out the garbage? That's why I spend half my life over at your house. Listen, did Mrs. Phillips change her mind about leaving yet? Jason asked. No, William said, but she brought the present she promised me. I forgot all about that. What was it? A castle, William said. A castle? William nodded. It's got four towers and a complete gatehouse and a chapel and a roof that lifts right off so you can see inside the bedrooms on the second floor. Can I come over this afternoon and see it? William didn't say anything for a moment. He hadn't decided yet whether or not to tell Jason about the Silver Knight. The other kids were filing into the classroom. Find your seats, please, the teacher said as he closed the door behind him. Can I? Jason whispered. Not today, okay? I have to go to a special gymnastics practice, William lied. Maybe tomorrow. The day seemed to drag by. The Silver Knight stayed in the back of William's mind all afternoon, and the teacher had to remind him twice to pay attention. By the time he left school, he had convinced himself that his adventures the night before were just a dream. Has anything ever happened to you that you wondered whether or not it actually happened or it was a dream? Share your experiences with your fellow listener. You're home early, Mrs. Phillips said. She was down on her knees by the flagstone walk in the front yard. What are you doing? William asked, turning over the soil for the border annuals. If the weather stays this warm, I'll be able to get the plants in before I leave. She started to get up. I, I don't need a snack today, he said quickly. You can finish what you're doing. But I thought we had to practice the back handsprings. I, I was going to spot you today. I want to play with the castle for a while. I'll be down soon. All right, she said. She went back to her digging, and he stopped at the kitchen door to glance at her. The curve of her back, the way her white hair fell down across her cheek, her crisscrossed gardening shoes tucked neatly under her skirt, everything about her made him feel safe and happy. He grabbed an apple from the bowl on the kitchen table and went up to the attic, turning over and discarding his various plans for making her change her mind about leaving. None of them seemed right. He knew he had to do something soon. He was so distracted by these thoughts that he almost tripped over the castle. Young man, hold up, hold up, cried the silver knight who was standing on the wall walk, waving frantically at William's knee. Sorry, William said, dropping down beside him. I was thinking about something. I, I didn't see you. Sir Simon looked indignant at the thought that anybody could forget about him. In your world, sir, I may be small. But in my own, I am known as a man to be reckoned with. I'm sure of that, Sir Simon, William replied quickly. Working his penknife out of his front pocket, he chopped a slice of apple into tiny bits and chunks and put them down on the battlements of the wall. It didn't seem proper to put a knight's food on the floor. 
I brought you something to eat, he said. I'll bring you more after dinner. Sir Simon ate quickly, spearing each piece of apple with his dagger. William lowered the drawbridge, and the knight joined him at the top of the attic stairs, glancing cautiously about him as he scrambled across the wide planks of the floor. William lifted him carefully up onto a trunk that had been pushed against the wall. To defend yourself against any unseen enemy, you should always keep a wall at your back, Sir Simon remarked as he settled into a comfortable sitting position. If you don't mind, sir, I want to know where you came from and how you got here, William said. I thought you would have some questions when you returned, young man. I cannot answer them all. Can you tell me what you do know then, William asked? Certainly. I hope you are comfortable because this tale will take me some little while to tell. William nodded. Please start. Very well then. I was the only son of my father, Lord Aquila, a noble and powerful knight who was at the end of his life a very sick man. He contracted an unknown disease that caused his limbs to weaken and shake so that for days at a time he would take to his bed. We called in respected doctors from all over the land and even from across the ocean. They did no good, although they charged high fees. It cost us dearly to board their servants and stable their horses while they took their time considering the matter of the disease and conferring with one another. At this point, the knight, clearly upset, got to his feet and began pacing back and forth. William was worried that he might fall off the edge of his lookout, but after a while he grew calmer and sat down again. At that time, Sir Simon went on, there was a wizard in my father's kingdom by the name of Alistair. Some months before my father grew ill, this man had arrived at the castle one morning seeking employment, and my father had taken pity on him. He was a raggle-taggle sort when he first appeared. His robe was torn and dusty, and he talked of having traveled long distances and having suffered much. From the beginning, I was more suspicious of his story than my father and pressed Alistair for details. He gave none. At first, Alistair seemed perfectly harmless. He was given a room down near the kitchen where he sometimes invited me to help mix up potions and salves and, and were supposed to straighten crooked bones and settle upset stomachs. He had a wardrobe in the room that he always kept locked and I noticed he was careful never to open it while I was there. The more I saw of Alistair, the less I really knew him. He was a man of secrets, some of which he told me, but more often I heard tales of the wrongs that had been done him. The stories were garbled, and I didn't pay much attention to the details, but I sensed, even then, his desperate need to control people, to have power. Let me give you an example. Around his neck, the wizard wore a length of woven ribbon from which dangled three medals or tokens. Once, early on in our acquaintance, when he, he still trusted me, he pulled that necklace out of his robe and showed it to me. In the middle hung a small flat disc made out of lead. At the time, I did not find it particularly interesting. I know better. Now, hanging from the ribbon on either side of the disc, there were two halves of one metal that showed the two faces of Janus. They had hinges, and Alistair told me that they could be fitted together when necessary, but he preferred to use them separately. The word January comes from Janus, doesn't it? William asked. Precisely, Sir Simon said. I see your education has not been entirely neglected. Janus guards the gates of heaven and looks both ways in time, but the image of Janus on Alistair's neck had an evil, magical power. One half of the token made things small, and the other restored them to their normal size. The symbols beside Janus's head on each surface were different. The side that made things small showed two staffs, the instruments of punishment. The other side showed two keys. I saw him work this magic on a rat. When he pointed the staff side, the rat shrank to the size of a toy. When he used the side with the keys, the rat returned to normal. I am convinced that most of Alistair's magic lay in that necklace, but I never learned much more about it, because after a while he grew secretive around me. Meanwhile, my father got steadily worse, the doctors were totally mystified, 
I suppose I was the one who thought of asking Alistair for help, though now I curse myself for the idea. He came and sat by my father's bed, asking about the symptoms and making a long list of some strange language. The next day, the wizard began administering an evil-smelling potion to my father, who took it reluctantly, as the taste was as bad as the odor. To our amazement, he appeared to get better. The palsy seemed less violent, and my father had long periods of peace when he could rest. It was not until much later that I realized the drug that helped him sleep was also slowly poisoning him. Alistair was hailed as a genius by all of us, and my father insisted that the wizard be given a large bedroom right next to his own. To everybody's relief, the doctors were bundled off to wherever they had come from. My father became quieter with every passing day, and he slept a great deal. When he was awake, he insisted that Alistair stay near him, for he felt the wizard was responsible for his recovery. I often came in to find them deep in conversation, and my father began to grow suspicious of me and of his own trusted counselors. Alistair was poisoning his mind and his body at the same time. William's legs were beginning to ache, so he shifted position. I am taking too long to tell this story, Sir Simon said quickly. I will hurry. So, what is Sir Simon saying? Summarize what he's told William so far with your fellow listener. And now, a few moments more of The Castle in the Attic. Just before, just days before my father died, he issued various edicts through Alistair. In these, the counselors were sent on missions to neighboring kingdoms. They objected, knowing my father was near death, it meant that they would have to return to the kingdom through the forest. Alistair had put some sort of spell on the forest to protect our kingdom from attack, and we knew the counselors would not be able to get back through. We were convinced Alistair controlled my father's every action, but my father would not even see us to listen to our arguments. Alistair had moved his pallet to my father's room, and he even ate his meals in there. The counselors had no choice but to leave, and after that, my only friend in the castle was my old nurse, Calendar, who had been with me since birth. She and I sat up late into the night discussing plans for defeating Alistair, but they came to nothing. My father died at last, and if there is anything I can thank Alistair for, it is that he went peacefully and without pain. But I can never forgive Alistair for turning my father against me. At the end, he would not speak to me at all, saying that I had been a traitor to him and to our kingdom. Sir Simon stopped speaking and covered his face for a moment. Then he went on. The day of the funeral, Alistair came to my room and showed me a paper that my father had signed before he died. It proclaimed that Alistair was to succeed my father as I was not fit to rule. Calendar was with me at the time. I was dressed in a full suit of armor as I was about to review the guard. I ripped the paper to shreds and the two of us attacked the wizard. Alistair pulled the necklace from under his robe, pointed the lead disc at me, and mumbled a word. I reached up and snatched the necklace, which fell off his neck. One half of the Janus medal came away in my hand. He lunged at me and tried to get it back, but I curled my fingers around it and held on. Calendar was trying to pull him off me, but I could not help her because by that time Alistair's spell had begun to work. The bottom half of me had already turned to lead. I could not move my feet or bend my knees. The night shuddered, remembering that moment. It was horrible. I cried out to Calendar, but she was no longer struggling with the wizard. They were both watching me, he with a terrible smile on his face, and Calendar the knight stopped speaking for a moment as if he were trying to work out something in his mind. I realize now that Calendar deserted me in the end. It was too late to save me, and she must have known she would be left behind with the wizard. At the very last moment, my face was growing smooth and cold. Alistair flipped the lead disc and pointed the other side at me. Then everything went black, and the next thing I saw was you. We'll find out more about what happens to Sir Simon the Silver Knight, William, and a whole lot more as the Castle in the Attic continues. <laughs>